So before you have any chance of creating a custom model, you first need to find some training data that the untrained model will be able to learn from. In supervised learning, this is a set of label data for which each entry has an example answer of what you're trying to predict. And you might need thousands of examples to get good results. You may remember from chapter two, in order to classify something, you will need to define some features or attributes that may be meaningful in helping you make a prediction. Previously, you saw an example for classifying fruit using weight and color, for example. But how do you use this collected data? When looking at real-world examples, you may see engineers reserve 80% of the available data for training the model, and 20% is set aside for testing it once trained. In this case, the flow of training a model would look like this. First, you train the model on the training set. You then evaluate the model on the test set. And finally, you keep tweaking the model's parameters based on how it performed on the test set. You would do this a number of times and then finally pick the model that works best on the test data. Now this is a good starting point, but there's a chance the model will try and change itself to simply perform well on the test data alone. Instead, you can randomly split your available data into three sets. One for training, maybe 70% of the data, one for testing, say 15% of the data, and the final one for validation, the final 15% of the data. Exact splits will depend on how much data you have available, so you may see variations of this. Now, in this case, the training process is slightly different. First, train a model on the training data. Next, evaluate the model on the validation data. Tweak the model to improve itself, repeat this a certain number of times, and then pick the best model that worked on the validation data. And then you can test that on the test data set to see how well it works on data it never saw before. This allows you to spot when the models overfit itself to the training data, which is where it essentially learned the examples perfectly and not generalize well. Instead, you test it against examples it never saw before to check for this. And this data is never used to make changes to the model, so it can never accidentally learn from it. Ultimately, you want a model that can generalize well and not just learn from the training examples, as the real world will contain unseen examples. But how do you obtain such data in the first place? First, if you're lucky, you may already have the data contained in your existing systems that are recorded in a form that can be directly used to train a model. Common sources for this include databases or server logs that you have control of or allow to use, and contain the features and attributes that you require in the right form. For example, maybe you're the owner of a recruitment business that has a database of users who've used the site for many years. During this time, you've managed to collect the user's attributes like years of experience someone has, the city they are from, and their current salary expectations. With this data, you might be able to train a model that can guess the expected salary of a new user who joins the site before they even tell you what it is, just by using their experience and location as inputs. As everything was recorded manually and you can verify it all exists and is accurate, the data quality is likely to be high, the cost to access the data is fairly low, and the time to obtain the data is very short. This is essentially the ideal situation to be in, and it should be noted that very few people have enough data in the right form that they can use to train a model like this out of the box. A more common situation is that you have to start recording the data you need once you've defined what it is. And the first way to do this would be to do it yourself. You could update your system to start recording such features, or you could use new sources like a questionnaire sent to your users, recording the results in a spreadsheet or database for the attributes that matter. In this situation, do remember to record such data in a machine learning friendly way. After all, everything must be re represented numerically to be sent to the machine learning model. And you may have to pre-process the data before it's usable to train such a model. In this case, the data quality is again potentially high as you still have control over how the data is collected However, the cost would increase as you will need to spend engineering time to do this, and it might take a long time to gather enough example data for your needs too. Now, if the problem you're trying to solve is something that research communities are also interested in, there's a good chance that an open source data set may exist that was put together by passionate folk for a given problem. One popular website known as Kaggle often sets challenges to the machine learning community whereby they provide data sets for a certain domain in the hope that people will compete to make the best performing model in return for a reward or status on the website. Many other companies, governments, and scientific communities 
also release public data sets like this too, and a quick search online will reveal many. Google even has a dataset search engine specifically for this at datasetsearch.research.google.com. It should be noted, however, that in this case, the data quality can be a variable quality, and some datasets are well validated and accurate, but others may contain mistakes or missing entries for certain features, and will need to be cleaned up before using. On this note, do look out for verified datasets from data science communities like those on datahub.io, which are often of a high quality and well suited for machine learning tasks. Therefore, the cost in using such data is low to medium, depending on how clean the data is, but the time to get the data is short. Finally, you could simply hire a third party company to gather the data for you from a whole army of people dedicated to finding or creating the data. In this situation, the data quality should be high as you'll have precisely defined what you need them to collect, but the cost might also be high as you need to pay all of these people, and the time taken will vary depending on the complexity of the task that you're trying to do, and many people will need to be trained to do that task too. Now the next question you may have is how much data do you need to gather? Well, there's no one answer that fits all situations here. However, generally speaking, the more good quality examples you have that can account for the variations and the edge cases you might expect to see in the real world, the better the chance the machine learning has to learn from that. Now, one thing to consider is the granularity of your data. Imagine you are training a model using sales data. If you only use data from days of the month of January, you may not learn about seasonal variations in sales like the holiday spikes or the other times of the year. At the very least, in this case, you want example data from each day of the year to at least 365 examples. And realistically, you probably want more than a few examples for each day over multiple years, bringing you to over a thousand data points pretty fast. It's not uncommon to need thousands of examples to get good results for machine learning systems, and some systems made by larger companies can use millions or billions of data points to train on. In fact, most of your time will be spent gathering suitable data and cleaning it so it can be used to train the model well. And on that note, you must ensure the data you use has been cleaned of any errors that could disrupt the training process. Once you've got thousands of examples, this can take time if manual checks are needed for things that cannot be automatically checked. In this fictional example I've made for house data, you can see how line two contains data from a different country. Here, the price and size are input using a different standard, one using British pounds instead of dollars, and square meters instead of square feet. On the third line, someone used uppercase letters, but the house types are the same as the first two. This could cause issues later if you assume it's a different type just because the case didn't match. And on the last line, one field was not filled out at all, and someone described the apartment as having 2.5 bedrooms when you're expecting an integer value. These issues come up more than you may imagine, and if you don't fix them prior to training, your model may not perform well when you try and use it. After your data is cleaned up, and you can see what you're left with, you can now set the features you want to use for training. It's tempting to use as many features as possible, and sometimes more features can help separate the data better, but choosing features wisely can often mean a smaller, more efficient model that can work just as well as a model that uses more features. Here, I selected price and size to see how well that works first before trying with more features as I feel size is a good general indicator of house price. If this yields acceptable performance, I might not need to consider other features at all. Finally, let's talk about data bias. Imagine you were tasked with collecting sound samples of people speaking English sentences for a voice recognition model. You go ahead and ask everyone you know to contribute samples and even hire a company to collect more from all over the country. What went wrong here? Well, if you're based in the USA, you now mainly have samples of US accents. If someone from the UK or India tried to use the train system, it may not be able to understand their accent. In this case, you've unwillingly introduced a bias into your data collection. You should be extra careful to try and identify any biases you have before collecting the data or defining the features and attributes you want to use when training the model. All right. You now know the essential concepts around gathering data, so it's time to go ahead and learn about the building blocks of machine learning models themselves. See you there. <laughs>